to introduce Mark Cain. It's my pleasure <laughs> to introduce David Strauss, who will chair session two. Thank you, Jim. Um, well, it's, it's, it's wonderful to be here, uh, to honor Shukla, and to see, see so many of his friends and distinguished colleagues here. Um, I want to welcome you to the session on reanalysis, climate change, and climate diagnostics. Um, it's going to be very brief. A really adequate introduction of Eugenia Calme, Leonard Benson, Mike Wallace, Kevin Trenberth, and Louis E. Cellini would take at least an hour, so I won't give them an adequate introduction. I want to simply say that they, they're all inspiring leaders in understanding the, uh, the atmosphere, predicting the atmosphere, and uh, understanding the, the mean and the variability of the atmosphere and the climate on time scales literally from days to centuries. Um, so this should be a really, uh, really interesting session. Um, the first talk is by Eugenia Calme, um, um, and the title is Shukla, My Lifelong Mentor. I need to pull down the microphone. <laughs> Uh, I, I, my, the title was Shukla, my lifelong mentor, but uh, I was told that, that uh, NSF needed a more scientific <laughs> uh, uh, title. <laughs> uh, I want to thank uh, all, sorry, I want, uh, let me check. Sorry. Uh, I want to, to thank my, my collaborators in, the, in this area of research, and actually I see several that are missing, but uh, uh, they are mostly people that did, uh, were my students, except for Jim Carton, who is my, my boss. <laughs> so I, I'd like to start uh, saying that Shukla was my early mentor in my student and, and postdoc years, and he's younger than me. I think the probability maximum is about two years or so, but younger, but uh, he's much wiser, and he was much wiser, and he was much funnier. And as an example, I'll talk about uh, uh, Philip's shorts. <laughs> I, I, I went to the University of Buenos Aires, and to me, going to the university was so pre amazingly important that I would never have dared use blue jeans to the university. And then, when I came in January, and when summer came, uh, uh, Phillips came with, with a pair of shorts, which was the most horrible I've ever seen. It was, <laughs> It was brilliant orange, and and uh, if a few weeks later Shukla came with the same shorts, <laughs> and and he convinced me that that uh, uh, Phillips had sold the shorts to him, <laughs> and uh, I believed him. It took me. <laughs> uh, also, when he had his comprehensive examination, it, he was famous for be, having been asked, so why aren't you participating in the, for, in the forecast competition for uh, uh, one of the cities was Boston? And he said, I cannot find Boston in the map. <laughs> that was in the comprehensive exam, yeah. So we have, we share certainly the, the uh, infinite admiration and, pre and respect for Charney, so I'm not going to go on on that. But uh, I kind of followed uh, his career. I, I think we, we both went at the same time to, to Godard. Uh, uh, we were in the, what is now the GMAO uh, organization, and, and uh, uh, it was a branch at that time, and, and Shukla was the head of climate, and I was the head of weather, and he called them twigs since we were in a branch. And Milt Mil Halem 
was a very powerful person. He was our boss and our mentor, and I learned a lot from both uh, Milt Heilemann and Shukla, and I'm not going to repeat that. Shall I say that? We, we used to meet every Wednesday and discuss the, the branch, and, and Milt would tell us, give us some orders, and he said, you should do this. And I thought to myself, okay, I don't want to, but I will do it. And, and Shukla said, I'm not going to do that dog work. Find somebody else. Uh, and wow, that was such a learning experience. <laughs> and also, I, I was always fascinated by, by what Shukla was doing. So with my interest in climate and in predictability also was very much sparked by, by Shukla. And uh, I was doing reanalysis uh, uh, for January and February of 1979, the special period, observing periods for, for Figi. So I did many <laughs> reanalysis with and without satellite data and this and that. And, and, but Shukla had the vision that this re type of reanalysis could should be done for a long time, and and so he passed me this this vision, and I, I was lucky to do it. And I should say also that one of the reasons it became so popular is because we included grads and facilitated the users' use. Okay, enough for. This so uh, classic data simulation has a, an analysis cycle, which is like like this. Uh, uh, yeah, it, but I I think I will make a ten-year prediction that in the next ten years the the there will be a lot of concentration on in using the analysis to improve the observation and using the analysis to improve the models because during the analysis cycle, the observations and the first initial forecast are together and easy to compare. And actually the analysis increments are, are the result of that comparison. And that pr gives a source of, 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 of information that is unique. So, uh, the, the, and especially with for the bar and ensemble common filter are the two advanced methods, and and uh, I, I like ensemble common filter because it's simple and it's very powerful. And uh, so the 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 main goal of of the data simulation is to combine optimally observations and model forecast. That that's why it was created. But that's really mostly done. But we should use data simulation to improve the observations, improve the model, also do more truly coupled data simulation. So for example, the ocean and the atmosphere are obviously coupled, so the best data simulation should also be coupled. And Earth system models used by IPCC have uh, many sub-models, but they don't include the human systems, which totally dominates the Earth system. So, I think that we should couple the the earth system human system and you do and do the data simulation to train it and I'm going to mention very quickly the that uh, at at the uh, uh, the University of Maryland Brian Hunt uh, developed uh, uh, an incredibly efficient and, and simple uh, uh, ensemble gamma filter and it's done grid point independently by grid points, and, and it, it uses observations to do localization. And it, it's so simple that all the equations can be written with large fonts in a single slide. <laughs> so the, uh, the, I also will mention the work of, of uh, uh, my former, our former student, uh, Penny, who uh, uh, was trying to, to apply the LTKF to the ocean and was having difficulties. And then he did this uh, study of, of the Lorenz 96 model in which he computed the LTKF for, for uh, uh, 
for, from uh, zero ob uh, one or uh, observations to 40 and, and from the uh, where ense one ensemble member two ensemble members to 40 and you can see that most of the uh, <coughs> most of the results are deep blue which means it's extremely accurate but if you, are, if you have few observations or if you have few ensemble members, you are in this horrible area which is, doesn't even converge. So that's the, the, the situation of the ocean. The atmosphere is a little bit better. So he invented a new uh, hybrid, which, which is very simple. Uh, and I would like to point out that ECMWF has... Uh, uh, has implemented a penis gain hybrid with excellent results. And, and they say that it's so simple that it took them only a week. And the, this hybrid is uh, not only better than the Elitic AF and the 4 bar, but it's even slightly better than the oper operational system. So that, I'd, I'd like to talk about coupling the ocean and the atmosphere. And that has been done by some pioneering groups. Uh, and and the uh, Shanking Zhang at GFDL did that. And you can see that the atmospheric model uh, assimilates only uh, atmospheric observations. So I guess you cannot see my finger, unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so the light blue is the, the light blue is the uh, atmospheric model which assimilates only atmospheric okay thank you sorry so the the uh, this is the, the way it's always been done the atmospheric model assimilates atmospheric observations and the ocean model assimilates uh, ocean observations only but uh, we decided to uh, try a uh, 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 strongly coupled LETKF uh, uh, and some, uh, an ensemble data simulation. And, and we have essentially a single uh, data simulation system which uh, re uh, receives from the forecast the, the equivalent to the observations in, in, in observation space, the forecast of the observations, and then that's compared with the real observations and this localization in space is done on the observations, and it allows uh, we we do it we do it so that uh, it allows the the ocean to see the atmospheric observations and the atmosphere to see the ocean observations. So, ocean sees atmospheric observations and atmosphere sees the ocean observations, and we test we tested this uh, with a. With, with a, 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 st a strong coupling of the ocean atmosphere, LTKF, and this is done by a student, Stravis Sluka. And we are using the Speedy Nemo uh, coupled model. Uh, I don't know if Fred Kucharski is here. Yes, he's here. He's here. Oh, uh, yeah, I, Fred is oh, okay. I, I haven't met you, but I want to thank you very, very, very much for this. Uh, so, the, the standard, uh, 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 we, we compare the standard weak coupling as a control and then test the strong coupling where the ocean sees the atmospheric observations and the atmosphere sees the ocean observations. And I'm going to present only one experiment, but the other is, uh, uh, is also gives very good results. So, the control is the weakly coupled data simulation and there are only atmospheric observations, so only the atmosphere obs uh, assimilates observation and then it drives the model. And strongly coupled yeah, is that the ocean also assimilates the atmospheric observations. And the results are presented here as a difference between the, the strong data assimilation and the, the errors of the strong data assimilation and the control. And red, means be, uh, better, and you can see that it's all red. And it's, it's really remarkable because with, with strongly coupled data simulation, the, the errors in temperature and salinity both decrease by about 
50 percent in uh, 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 and the the improvements uh, reach the bottom levels as well after 10 years and in on top of that uh, the better ocean the ocean improved by assimilating atmospheric observation in turn up, um, improves the atmosphere so this is the positive impact that that using an ocean that <laughs> look at that the atmosphere does on the atmosphere itself so this is extremely promising so another thing is improve observations and and uh, we use uh, something that I stumbled into, uh, ensemble forecast sensitivity to observations and what we got. I, I'm not a mathematician, but I managed to derive a very simple formula to do this. And we, uh, we have been using this to, to correct observations by looking at the six hour forecast and, and seeing uh, which observations improved or made the forecast worse. And uh, let me uh, ski, uh, this shows that in, in for this particular day, the modest winds are at both at six hours and 24 hours are, are making the, for, the six hour forecast worse at the six hour forecast worse and the 24 hour forecast worse. And, and this is a, a very nice example. Uh, uh, obviously, there is something wrong with the uh, with the algorithm, and there are some, like one third of the observations that are paint, uh, painted red that make the six hour forecast worse. So we took out the, the red observations and, and made a, a 24 hour forecast, and it clearly improved the results. And this is very, very powerful, and it could accelerate the use of new instruments and other things. So. Uh, very quickly, uh, five minutes. Okay, so maybe we we manage we manage to to uh, assimilate precipitation efficiently by converting the the observations in, into Gaussian the precipitation observations into Gaussian because they are obviously not Gaussian and the the system expects uh, Gaussian observations and errors. And this resulted in 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 improved forecast for the first time. The model remembers uh, the forecast, and and this is how it uh, well. And with real data, we got the same. And I want to mention that uh, the models can be improved, and they can be improved in two at at least two different ways using the data simulation. One is parameter estimation, which can be done very efficiently, and the other is estimation of bias using the data simulation analysis increments and the, I'll, I'll skip the rest uh, we under the direction of Ines Fung we uh, we managed to to show that uh, we could estimate without observations surface fluxes of, of carbon just by you as if they were parameters that change evolve with time and uh, I'll mention quickly uh, the Earth and, and human system, and uh, they are done. They are not coupled, even though the Earth system is completely dominated by the human system. And IPCC models and even integrated assessment models don't include the population. It is exogenously obtained from UN projections and. Uh, this is a, 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 a graph from from IPCC that showed how the models evolved. And, and when I Shukland I started, we we only had an atmospheric model and a land model. But uh, until uh, the ocean was coupled in two ways, we could not predict El Niño because El Niño is an interaction between the ocean and the atmosphere. And currently, we are we have lots and lots of sub models for the Earth system, but we are completely missing the most important co a, a co com a component of the Earth system, which, which is the human system. And I'm going to to skip uh, the rest. And uh, we we 
we developed a, a model, a handy model that became quite quite famous, uh, uh, and and uh, a human and nature interaction model. And and we found I'll I'll just show this result. We we showed that that if the the if if the population is is uh, divided into rich and poor, and the rich make like a hundred times more than the poor, it's essentially impossible to avoid, avoid a, a societal collapse. And but we have used only only a, a regenerating nature. So the the red line is the the rich, which, which we call uh, a, a elites, in order to not to be offensive. But uh, it, it, this is multiplied by their their consumption, which is a hundred times larger, and and the the the, com, the poor die first when when they they grow too much, and the rich think, wow, we are doing well, but they also collapse. But what happens if we add fossil fuels, and because this was only regenerating, like like crops or or forests or fisheries. And when when we added fossil fuel, what we found was that the collapse was postponed by 200 years and the population increased by a factor of 20. And, and this is uh, eerily reminiscent of, of what has happened after the Industrial Revolution. Basically, we are eating we are eating oil. That's what makes allows us so. So I'll I'll, I'll think here, uh, I'll stop here. But I would like to say thanks, Shukla, for your leadership and inspiration. Uh, uh, actually, the the two first authors of the the uh, handy paper are here, and, and they are Safa Motesare and Jorge Rivas, and. And uh, uh, we are also writing a paper to PNAS that Mike uh, Wallace has kindly agreed to, to uh, uh, edit. Uh, and, and basically, the message is that we need to couple uh, in two directions the, the, the human system with the Earth system. Because uh, trying to predict what will happen with a human system when it's not, when you don't include the feedback between the population, for example, and, and, and food and everything else, it's like trying to predict El Nino with a, a very wonderful atmospheric model and then getting the sea surface temperatures from the United Nations as a, as a, as a uh, exogenous input. It doesn't. You you just don't get the right answer. So this is basic. Ah, and and this paper I am proud to say has uh, Shukla and Mark Cain and and others as uh, wonderful co-authors. Uh, just very quick point. I'm so glad you brought up population because uh, um, I, I'm not quite sure you're aware that the United Nations has underestimated the growth by the end of the century by two billion. So, uh, uh, they've so underestimated the growth of the global population by two billion, uh, principally because of undercounting in Africa. And I sort of wonder when we go to Paris in a few months' time, and we're talking about cutting back, cutting back CO2, all very important, but what we're not doing is talking about the most important thing, which is population. I, I couldn't agree more. <laughs> Thank you.